I am Paul Karch of First Congregational Church in Madison and chair of the Wisconsin Conference Board of Directors, on whose behalf I greet you. All of us, UCC churches in Wisconsin, like the rest of the world, have come through a year of pandemic, political turmoil, loss, and physical separation, which have challenged our hopes, our work, our plans, our families and friends, our congregations, our communities, and our leaders. Thank you all for enduring and adapting to these challenges and continuing to creatively and vibrantly live out the values of Jesus in this time and place. Our mission at the Wisconsin Conference is to support you, our churches and leaders. Welcome to this conference-wide worship service. May we continue into the coming year guided by faith and powered by generosity. Thank you. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. God of all creation, we come together from across the Wisconsin Conference ready to worship you. As we center ourselves, we quiet our minds so that our ears might hear what you are saying to us. God, we open our hearts and minds to the abundance in your creative world. You are the source of all blessing your grace overflows. We remember that we are each uniquely made in the image of God. We seek to celebrate our differences as well as what we share in common. Open our hearts so that we see you in the eyes of our neighbors, the stranger, the immigrant, the oppressed. We pray for the presence of your spirit here in this time and this place. May your spirit fill us and inspire us to generously share your extravagant love and blessings. We give thanks for your everlasting love and guidance. Amen. Thank you. 
A reading from 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Now it is not necessary for me to write to you about the ministry to the saints, for I know your eagerness, which is a subject of my boasting about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Echaniah has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you may not prove to have been empty in this case, so that you may be ready, as I have said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you in this endeavor. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for this bountiful gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a voluntary gift and not as an extortion. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. 
Yes, I'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work we with will each work. other. We will work side, side by side. side. We will work we with will each work. other. We will work side, side by side. And we'll guard God each one's dignity and save dignity each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to God from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, God's only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And thou know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, thou know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And thou know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, thou know we are Christians by our love. Hi, I'm Aiden Congleton, and I go to North High School. Here's my faith statement. Over the years, the church has played a large part in my life, a place of learning, a place of community, and most importantly, a place of belonging. The church and Christianity largely influence our daily lives without us even realizing it. This long history of Christianity's influence has shaped our country and our culture, and it is important that the church remains relevant in the future. The decreasing rates of Christian religious identity and the sharp increase in atheism has negatively impacted churches both financially and socially, not being seen as places of community but as exclusive and private strongholds of past beliefs. Churches are, in general, being seen by a younger, more diverse generation as unwelcoming and bigoted institutions that disrespect and persecute based on sexual orientation or nationality. These are not the teachings of Jesus our Savior. These are not the loving and accepting ways to treat people that the Bible has taught us. We need, in the time of religious decline, is unity. In truly Christian ideas such as acceptance and love, not exclusion and oppression. We need to spread our beliefs in a respectful and inviting way to show people the path of an accepting Christianity. A truly Christian Christianity. Where no one is shunned, rejected, prohibited, or prevented. From the embrace of God. We must show the world that we will not allow our beliefs to be washed away by cynicism and distrust in the church, but we must reform our disunited religion and truly share the voice of God. I hope only that we can change our actions today to preserve the bright future for Christianity tomorrow.
to go around. There is enough. There is enough. There is enough to go around. There is enough. Years ago, back when I was in a local congregation, we faced a problem in worship. The children would come up front for kids' time rambunctious. My colleague, the Reverend Bridget Flad Daniels, now at Union UCC in Green Bay, one Sunday had the children join her in prayer. She taught them to breathe in and to breathe out, saying three times, Holy Spirit, bring us peace. Prayer worked. The children settled down and engaged in conversation with Bridget. So, so we kept saying that prayer at the beginning of the children's time. And soon we heard from their parents of how the children were making use of it at home. The boy scared by a sudden storm who prayed it. And the girl sitting in a shopping cart at the grocery store, concerned when her parents started putting Brussels sprouts in the cart. Holy Spirit, bring us peace. I found myself, I find myself thinking of that prayer at many times in my own life, and those breaths. The breath prayer calms me, changes me. I ask you to try it with me this morning at the beginning of our sermon to put your hand on your chest so you can feel your breath. As you breathe in, say to yourself, spirit. And as you breathe out, peace. Deep breaths, three times. Amen. For me, praying that way connects me to my body and the whole arc of life. The Reverend Bob Allman, part of the Tending the Soul initiative of the conference, once pointed out the, the very first act of life. We breathe in. You know, the baby passes through the birth canal and it squeezes their whole body and their lungs until their head pops out and they breathe in the first breath. And in our very last act of life, we breathe out. As a person dies, the lungs relax, and you hear it, a final exhalation. We begin life by receiving, and we end life by sharing. It's not just the rhythm of our breath, but the whole pattern of our lives. Receiving, sharing, spirit, peace. What the gospel would teach us about generosity can be found in our breath. We know generosity in the depth of our bodies, receiving, sharing, spirit, peace. As I grow in my own practice of generosity, I keep coming back to those embodied lessons. I've come to realize 
how much I've received from the very first moment of life, receiving breath, but also receiving friendship and love and grace. And I'll spend the rest of my life responding to those amazing gifts, particularly that of the grace from God, receiving, sharing, spirit, peace. Generosity is the rhythm of our lives. In our reading this morning from 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul calls the believers in Corinth back to the practice of generosity. Paul writes out of a concern for a problem. Earlier in the congregation, uh, earlier, the congregation in Corinth made a pledge towards Paul's campaign to support people experiencing poverty in Jerusalem, an international relief mission. But the Corinthians never fulfilled their pledge, and it's a delicate moment. 2,000 years ago and today, people are sensitive around issues of money. Paul's letter could trigger feelings of shame, of defensiveness, of guilt. We may have felt all of those feelings around issues of money and church. I appreciate, particularly in this section of the letter, the way Paul makes generosity not a demand, but, but a call. Not a bill, but a way of life. Not an invoice, but an invitation. That call to generosity comes most clearly when Paul says, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. But that rendering of Paul's language seems unnecessarily convoluted to me, so I'll translate it more simply as, God makes grace abound, more than enough, so that you can do every good deed abundantly. I wanna look closely at the two halves of what Paul says. First, God makes grace abound, more than enough, Second, so you may do every good deed abundantly. It's that pattern of our breath, that rhythm of life, receive, share, grace enough, do good. The Corinthians back in, in Paul's day, like many Americans today, believed in self-sufficiency, the self-made person. But in contrast to that myth of being self-sufficient, Paul points the way God blesses our lives. God makes grace abound. In an earlier letter to the same church, Paul said, what do you have, what do you have that you did not receive? I know it in my own life. I've received ever since that first breath as a baby, the world itself echoes with abundance. Last year, my husband and I moved to a cabin near Shawano, Wisconsin. The previous owners cultivated a large garden, dozens of fruit trees, berry bushes, and, and plants, asparagus, rhubarb, garlic. So much came up that we hadn't planted. We gathered what another had sown. Our cabin sits on the traditional lands of the Menominee people, and some of my neighbors are Menominee. They're teaching me about the land. One neighbor walked me through the woods, showing me where I can find ramps in the spring. His wife pointed out a plant with healing properties. She said, if you get a, a bad insect bite, bruise the leaves of this plant and put it on, and it will heal faster. Whether in my garden or out in the woods, I'm learning how much grace abounds. But there is more, there is more abundance than what we see in the garden or the field. We're born into a world of relationships with God, with nature, with each other. Martin Luther King, offering a contrast to that myth of self-sufficiency, often said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Do you feel the abundance, the blessing, the grace in that inescapable network? I certainly know that pandemic made me realize my longing for community. This last year of living socially distant, of connecting virtually, of not hugging, it all left me aware of how deeply God made me for community. Certainly I've realized that I'm not self-sufficient, not alone in this world, but instead I'm connected 
interdependent, caught in relationships, all of which is grace. And whether it comes through nature or friendships, all of that grace comes ultimately from God. I hold close to my heart the words of an English theologian who once spoke of all the ways we experience abundance, saying, from all of this we can see that the only God we know is a God who is an immense movement of giving. The divine is the verb to give, conjugated in every mood. These words remind me that God, the giver, first gave us life and then gave us new life in Jesus, the one who embodied the generosity of God, the same Jesus who said, this is my body given for you. Paul wants us to breathe in this abundance, to fill our souls with the awareness of this blessing so that our minds expand with the knowledge that God's grace abounds more than enough. This is the first movement of generosity, to realize how much we've received. But we can't hold our breath. We can't just receive it and keep it. We breathe in and then we release it. Receive, share. We give back. That's the second movement of generosity. This is where the Corinthians struggled. They didn't face a resource problem, but a heart problem. They didn't want to share. Paul alludes to it, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now too many stewardship talks quote that last phrase, God loves a cheerful giver. It, it might even seem like a groaner of a comment now. But think about what it means. God would rather a cheerful giver than a five-figure giver. God cares more about the change in our hearts than the cha-ching in the plate. Many people describe this heart question using the distinction between a mindset of scarcity and a mindset of abundance. A mindset of scarcity makes us think that we will never, there will never be enough. We must compete one against another because there is never enough to go around. Scarcity, scarcity thinking names all the things we cannot do, all the things we cannot share. But Paul speaks of abundance, that there will be more than enough. When we realize how much we've received, we can begin to ask, how do I share? Now, sometimes the question of sharing becomes, how much? As if the money is ours, but we need to give God a cut, which sounds less like charity and more like taxation, as if God were a cosmic IRS agent auditing your gross adjusted income to tabulate what you owe. But God doesn't run a divine version of the IRS. Instead of asking, how much? We can ask a better question. How does our life reflect the generosity of God? Or how does God's blessing of our life get shared beyond us? The way we answer that question depends so much on our awareness of abundance. Earlier, I pointed to how Martin Luther King spoke of interconnectedness. The more aware we are of our own interconnectedness, the more we share. Paul, fully aware of God's grace abounding, saw the mutuality of all life. We often overlook the way that Paul speaks of people experiencing poverty and need. That's our modern way of talking, to describe people by what they lack, what they don't have, the poor, the hungry, the homeless. But in his letters, Paul never uses those phrases. Instead, he talks of the saints. And when he describes his collection for desperate people in Jerusalem as the ministry to the saints, elsewhere he talks of sisters and brothers. No wonder, no wonder Paul couldn't hold on to anything because who could hold back from someone you dearly love? A sister, a brother, 
a saint. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and when I was a child, an awful plane crash took place. During a winter cold snap, a plane taking off from Reagan International uh, Airport crashed into the 14th Street Bridge and spilled over into the Potomac and began rapidly sinking. A few people made it out of the plane uh, and into the icy water around, around it. A helicopter came in to start rescuing people. And one of those on the wreckage was, was Arlen Williams. And when the lifeline was dropped to Arlen Williams, he passed it to another passenger. And he kept doing this five times as five people were rescued. And when they came back the sixth time, the cold had overcome him and he had slipped below the water. When I think of generosity, I remember Arlen Williams passing that rope to another. He gave till his last breath. It's that his generosity imitated that generosity of Jesus. I'm no Arlen Williams, but his example and that of other courageous people makes me ask, how can I share in ways that reflect God's generosity? To me, the practice of generosity involves two movements. First, the realization of God's abundance, the awe in the face of all we have received. And second, the question of how I can reflect that generosity, the courage to share all I've received. That's the rhythm of generosity. Receive, share, spirit, peace. Alleluia and amen. Who will speak if we don't? Who will speak if we don't? Who will speak so their voice can be heard? Oh, who will speak if we don't? Who will work if we don't? Who will work if we don't? Who will work so their voice can be heard? Dear friends, we come to a time of prayer in our worship service. I invite you to center yourselves by taking a few deep breaths in and out. May this rhythmic breathing be a reminder to us of all the blessings we take in and all the grace we bring forth. I invite you now into a time of prayer. God of all grace and every blessing, we thank you in this season of Easter tide for the hope that comes through the resurrection story for the beauty of springtime blossoming forth, for the promise of better days to come as we envision the ending of a long pandemic. All glory and praise we offer to you, God who has brought forth new life and love even in the midst of death and despair. 
spirit of strength and healing. We do pray this day for all who suffer the effects of isolation, for the anxious, the lonely, those who are depressed and addicted. We pray for all who grieve losses. We remember with gratitude those who courageously serve on the front lines, especially those who tend to the physical and spiritual, the emotional and mental health needs of so many hurting souls. God of refuge and redemption, we lift up people and places in this land and throughout the world where economic inequities, racial disparities, and horrific violence persist. Remind us again, there is no higher calling than to advocate and act for the dignity and equality and fair opportunities of all your people. Through the light of Jesus' teachings, we recognize the abundance and goodness that surround us. We confess that too often privilege and power possess us. Yet we know the only faithful response to your blessings is one of humble generosity. In Jesus, you have taught us a love that is infinite a grace that abounds, a peace that endures. So invite us, again, invite us, holy God, to place our trust in you, to keep this gospel faith, and to live this day and all our days in ways that build up your beloved community. In Christ our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. This year's annual meeting offering is dedicated to the 217 local churches of the Wisconsin Conference. It has been a difficult year for our churches and our nation, and indeed for the world. And we are deeply grateful for the faith and ministries of our pastors and our congregations. So we ask you to give generously to your own church today. Do not send your offering to the Wisconsin Conference. Send it directly to your church with words of gratitude and hope. Let us join our hearts and our spirits in prayer as we dedicate today's offering to God. Let us pray. We are your body, God of life. We are your hands outstretched to give and to receive. We are your eyes focused on the beauty and the hardship of life. We are your muscle carrying the weight of work and creativity. We are your community of love, your collective faithful body where the miracles of compassion and generosity flow like blood through our veins. Bless our bodies and our churches and our offering this day for the well-being of all that you have created. Amen. Express. 
Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, those all bound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, those all bound. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt, gives us love to tell, bread to share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, those so bound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, those so bound. Let us pray. We make our offerings small and large with the hope and confidence that all we do, all we offer, all we say, all we think, and all we hope will take root in this world and be the source of new expressions of God's love, of God's justice, of God's character, of God's mission, and of God's reign. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, through us, alongside us, despite us, and for us. Amen.
And now, my friends, since you have been and are abundantly powered by generosity, fueled by the grace of God, energized by the Holy Spirit, and fired up by what you have heard, seen, experienced, and learned during this worship service and our annual meeting, may you go forth charged with love to touch and transform, heal and reconcile, renew and redeem wherever you are with whatever you have in every way possible. Amen.